Good morning, Internet. My name is EJ, and I am back once again with another narrated time lapse of my art video. Uh, this time, we'll be taking a look at uh, an illustration that I just finished this year called I'm Okay to Go. Um, so, yeah, to start things out with, let's just go ahead and talk about what's going on in the screen right now. And in the screen, I am uh, going through a bunch of thumbnails uh, just to get the good look as to how this lady astronaut is going to end up looking like now i say astronaut because in the end of the illustration this is pretty much what ended up uh happening with the illustration but initially this was something else which i'll talk about later on in the video but for now let's just concentrate on the thumbnails so to do this thumbnails and to do them quick i uh, depended a lot on shapes um, as you can see right now I'm just um, I just used the color gray to block out the shape just to kind of give me a general idea of the pose of the astronaut and then I went back with a quick outline to just kind of help me figure out where things were gonna be so I did a few of these thumbnails. Uh, I did about 10 or so, maybe 8. I'm not quite sure. I don't remember. But this was done fairly quick, uh, fairly fast. You know, not much thought in it. It was very loose. Uh, I didn't care so much as to what the overall look was going to be, as to what the overall design was. I was just kind of just looking for a pose and for anything that kind of looks good. So, yeah. Um,. And as soon as I get like the final pose uh, or the general idea of the pose, um, I'm going to go back over that general pose and kind of refine some details some more, which is what I'm about to do. But yeah, this is the first round of concept thing that I did, um, the concept thumbnails. So that was like the first round. And then in the second round, I'm going to take my favorite post, which is pretty much just the last post. That was what my favorite post was. Um, I pretty much took that last pose. Uh, well, right now I'm kind of distracted trying to do something else. But in the end, I just ended up going with the last post. So um, I'm not really sure what my train of thought was um, in this particular part right now. But I know that I took that last pose, the one uh, at the end of that um, group of eight drawings. I took that pose and pretty much used it to come up with the astronaut pose eventually. So yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure what this detailed thing is. Um, I guess I originally wanted to go with something else. I've always thought that I was just going to go for that last pose but somehow I find myself doing this sketch um, so yeah oh there it is there it is okay so I guess at that point I was still kind of you know looking for um, the general pose of the astronaut and I guess eventually I ended up back with the last post, the eighth post. So there it is. So yeah, I'm going to take that last one. As you can see, I'm going to zoom it up, which I just did. And then I use the concept thumbnails as my photo bash. <laughs> Instead of grabbing a bunch of photos, I decided to use my old artwork to photo bash in as colors for this next round of concept thing. Um, so for this next round of concept thing, I, I went through this very quick also. Um, as you can see, I'm doing some photo bashing in, but a lot of these details got knocked out eventually. Um, I was just kind of just using them as guides in a way. And again, I, I've mentioned this numerous occasions before, but it always bears repeating just, you know, because it is important to repeat it. But the photos I'm using are from photobash.org and textures.com. Those are my two favorite sites to go to to grab photos to use for my artwork. So yeah, if you are in need of photos, um, go to those two sites. Um, 
So yeah, there's plenty of other sites as well, uh, plenty of good stock sites out there. But for me, I've predominantly been going to those two sites. So yeah. But yeah, so I did a combination of photos and my old drawing to use as a photo bash and um, for the astronaut. And really, what I'm really after is just kind of like a, a base paint, kind of like a, a somewhat smoothed out um, area to paint on and to put on my details. So, which is what this lady is pretty much. Um, this base that I'm looking we're looking at right now is again pretty much end up being the base paint for uh, another three concepts that I'm gonna work on so yeah um, so I went through like one round of concepting and then this is like my second round of concepting initially uh, just to kind of get my bearings some more on what the look of this astronaut's going to be. So yeah. But yeah, as you can see, I've come up with like three different ones, um, different lighting schemes and whatnot. So I already had it in my mind to do like some form of light within the actual astronaut suit, um, the space suit. And so that's what those neon green lights are. It's kind of glowing lights that's kind of like embedded into her uh, outfit essentially. And I think this is going to be about the third base paint. So I made base. So at this point, I've made two base paints. I think this is about to be my third base paint. And then after I'm done with all the base paints, then I will go back again with a sketch to finalize like the details. And then eventually I will choose on one that I like to develop some more. So yeah. So here's the first one. Um, kind of just doing some quick sketches using that base paint as a guide to where things was going to be. Um, drawing her face in. And then I did an initial sketch of the helmet, which I kind of knocked out for now while I work on the face. And I will bring back that old um, helmet sketch and then tie this in with the, with the girl, as you can see in about a few seconds or so. There it is. There goes back the helmet. Or the, the, there's the helmet back again. And I, re I went through a very long um, iteration process with this illustration because I went through a concept thumbnail phase and then I went to a more developed concept thumbnails which is this three right here and then after I pick one out of this three I developed that one some more as a speed paint of sorts I mean I considered it speed paint because I think I only spent like about five six hours on it which is long for a speed paint I will admit because I honestly think speed paint should be around two to three hours 30 minutes so about three hours or so um but yeah, after doing these three quick uh, thumbnails, um, I ended up with a piece that I developed for another five hours. And after I was happy, or after I turned, or let me take it back. After I was done with that one, I developed that one some more. And... Um, so yeah, <laughs> this, this was just such a long process now that I, <laughs> I'm like trying to look back at how long I worked or look back on this and I, I worked so much on this. I just realized I worked a lot on it. Um, but yeah, I guess to fully explain <laughs> what happened, I guess I might as well go back and tell the story of how this illustration came about. So 
How this illustration came about was that this was a prompt for a character of the week um, from the old conceptart.org site. Um, so sometime around last year, conceptart.org character of the week, the, they came up with um, Moire, I think was the one who came up with the prompt. He came up with a prompt for the competition for that week and the prompt was an antibody soldier um which is what this initial design was it's supposed to be an antibody like a you know little minuscule soldier that gets shrunk in and sent into someone's bloodstream or something or i think the original idea was that you know a regular sized human meets an alien that is so huge they could enter that alien's bloodstream or something something to that effect i think that was the original idea so initially this was not supposed to be an astronaut this is supposed to be some biological like like a person that's supposed to be like a biological weapon inside the big huge alien so yeah <laughs> now um that was the original prompt but given that the design kind of called for a, I guess like a suit. I mean, the design called for a suit that one could use. Well, um, a suit that would allow a wearer to breathe oxygen, essentially. That's what I was trying to get at. Wow, that was wordy in my head. Um, since that the design called for that, you know it was kind of easy to like just pretty much translate that design into a spacesuit kind of deal which is you know after i competed in that um prompt i ended up just taking my entry for that prompt and developing it into an astronaut instead of like the antibody it's basically the whole story <laughs> and that's basically what the whole story was i was given a prompt i designed a prompt for the antibody soldiers i turned something in for that prompt um which is the one after this three and then after i turned that in for the prompt i took what i turned in for that prompt and developed it furthermore and made it into an astronaut instead of an antibody soldier so Phew, yeah, long story over. Good job telling that story. Wow, okay. None of that story is done. I could talk about the thumbnailing process. So, when I was working on this entry, or when I was working on this illustration, basically what happened was I created thumbnails, about eight of them. I picked my favorite posts out of them. I came up with three more concepts. And out of those three concepts, I developed one to turn in for the contest. The one I turned in was the speed paint that I was talking about. The one that I spent maybe five to six, maybe even seven hours. I'm not sure. Um, still too long for a speed paint, which is what I mentioned earlier. But, you know, I mean, it's still done fairly quick. It's not a 30 hour uh, illustration for sure so but once i turned that in um what i did was sometime this year i picked that entry of mine and i decided to develop it more and that is what became this illustration so so yeah that's the whole thumbnailing process story right there <laughs> yeah so long and convoluted to tell but Anyways, so what is going on right now is I think this is going to be my third sketch. It could be my second. It could be my third. But again, like I said, I did eight and then I did three and then I picked one and then I speed painted one and then I took that one and turned it into a full blown illustration. So if I'm not wrong, we're on the third sketch right now. Um, and I think after this one is when I start speed painting that third concept.
Okay, I was wrong. That was actually the second one. This is my third one. <laughs> this is going to be the third one. Yep, and there I am starting out to sketch the third antibody slash spacesuit. Uh, spacesuit, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and if I'm not wrong, this pretty much ended up becoming the final version. Because that jetpack behind her pretty much ended, pretty much looks exactly like the final illustration. So yeah, this was the piece that I decided to speed paint. But yeah, I feel like my thumbnail process for this particular illustration took much longer than my normal thumbnailing process. Um, I spent quite a lot of time trying to figure out uh, what my illustration was going to be like. So yeah, this was an immensely involved process. Most of the time, uh, when I do my illustrations, sometimes I, I don't even really go through the thumbnail process. Sometimes I just stick with one image that gets stuck in my head and I just follow along with it. But in this particular case, I, I really explored a lot of options. And um, in a way, I was almost kind of aimless throughout this whole thing. Uh, but eventually, I did find my footing and I eventually ended up you know with a choice to go with so instead of just going around in in circles instead of going around in circles and deciding and redeciding whatnot although there were a few moments during the detailing phase where i got really lost uh, as to how to approach it, some certain details and i felt like i was really doing a huge run around but yeah. Where's my concept sketch? This is the one that I ended up speed painting. And I just now realized I didn't even really use the base paint that I worked on earlier. Um, I guess at this point the base paint is what I'll use as my base for the speed paint. But for those concept sketches, I, I just realized I just turned in concept sketches and not a speed painted one. Huh, I just now saw that. So yeah, it's always so interesting to look back at these, uh, at this process that I did. Um, 
so yeah it's always kind of enlightening uh looking back at it because even though this was only a few months ago you know the thought process that was going on then at the time when i was in the middle of creating it uh it's hard to figure out exactly what i was thinking because really honestly half the time when i'm drawing and when i'm painting i don't really think actively i mean i kind of sort of do i mean there's like a million thoughts running through my head you know and there's also like this part of my brain is kind of deciding on things but it's not really so much as an active conversation it's more of like an intellectual not an intellectual uh an instinctive thing so yeah when i make decisions i don't really sit there in my head saying oh yeah i like that i'm gonna go with that <laughs> i don't really think like that it's more like a feeling where i'm like you know I get certain intuition as to how to take the illustration. Although there are some cases where I do actively think and say, oh yeah, I like that versus not liking that. And I vocalize it in my head. There were there are those occasions. But for the most part, I am extremely instinctive when I'm doing my work. And again, you just saw me do some photo bashing in, and uh, I've mentioned this quite a few times before. Um, there's times where I use, where I do photo bashing so I could get uh, some photo textures into the piece. And there's times where I photo bash just to get some color information in. Um, in this case, when I photo bash that photo of that canon, I, I wasn't you know putting it in the illustration just to i could use some details from that canon um I, I wasn't trying or planning on using any of the details from that canon to use for the details for this piece instead i use it for color information and just kind of like color noise you know as you can see right now when i blended everything in it's just kind of this soup of color i guess it's what I've been calling it lately but yeah this soup of color is a nice base uh, to paint on which is pretty much what I'm gonna end up doing So I'm um, trying to lasso in some parts of her suit that I wanted to be a different hue. Uh, and at the end of the illustration, these lassoed parts pretty much end up becoming like the bands or like a belt looking thing uh, that wraps around her suit. So yeah, I slightly changed the hue on it. And later on throughout, throughout the illustration, it becomes more pronounced. So yeah. And I worked in a very low resolution for this particular uh, speed paint. Um, because I know I didn't want to over detail as much because I'm notorious for wanting to over detail. So really, um, the speed paint that I turn in for the prompt um, it was done in a very low resolution I think it was I think I only have the height around 800 pixels or maybe 900 pixels and so I think the width was around 300 pixels so everything was pretty much under a thousand pixels so it was very very low resolution and I did it on that purpose because I know that I if it was any bigger, I would get suckered into detailing fairly quickly, which I wanted to avoid.
So yeah, for the next few minutes, I'm pretty much detailing this piece, um, slash speed painting details in. Um, again, like I said, it was about five to seven hours um, that I worked on this. But pretty much, I'm just going over through the whole thing, kind of um, defining some edges, delineating my edges, adding the highlights, and accentuating the shadows. Kind of pretty much like what I do when I detail. Except for this one, it's not as involved as my typical detailing process because, like I said, this was supposed to be a speed paint, so I was trying to do this as fast as I can so that I can have something to turn in for the child prompt.
So now that I've been looking at it, I pretty much would have to say that this isn't really a speed paint anymore because this is so much more detail than what a speed paint should get. So yeah, I guess at this point in time I could just say that this is kind of like a mini developing of an illustration. Because, I mean, from the looks of it, there's really nothing more, nothing different from what I'm doing now compared to what I do when I'm doing my normal detailing process for an illustration. Um, everything that I'm doing right now is so much more detailed than a speed paint. So yeah, at this point, I can't really call this a speed paint anymore. Although I, it honestly felt like it was because it felt like I only worked on it for five to seven hours. Like I said, I could be wrong. Maybe I worked on it much longer than I thought I did. So yeah. But yeah, overall, the illustration took me forty hours. Um, this one that I decided to turn in for the Chow and prompt, though, I. I mean, just from looking at it and looking back at it, it's a lot more. Yeah, I did a lot more for that child prompt than I thought I did. Because, yeah, this is pretty involved. Wow. I saw myself cutting and pasting a lot and then bringing back some details. And see, so like, look at all those uh, little details that I'm putting into her spacesuit. If this was a speed paint, I would have just faked it with a brush with a brush instead of actually drawing it out like I am but look at me I'm actually drawing it out so yeah at this point I wouldn't qualify this as a speed paint anymore it's just regular old illustration at this point so yeah
is the complete concept right there. Uh, so that's the one I turned in for the child competition, the one on uh, on the left. Um, so yeah, it was very low resolution, like I mentioned. Everything was under a thousand pixels, but you know, it did the job of showing what my intention was. Um, so yeah, as a concept, it's a good standalone piece. It can stand on its own. Um, yeah, and even a 3D artist can probably create a 3D character out of that character concept. So, yeah. But I really wanted to take that illustration and really push it further more, which is what is going on in the screen right now. Um, I took that Chow entry that I did, uh, sized it up, make it bigger. And then, again, I started going through the detailing process. Um, so yeah, as a quick explanation of my process, basically what I do when I'm painting is that I go through a sketch phase and I color it in and then I mess things up by adding photos. Um, the photos kind of act as texture sometimes. Sometimes the photos kind of act more as uh, colors um or adds colors to the to the thing so basically i make things ugly by photo bashing some stuff in and then i put them all in one layer blend them all in so i kind of have this base paint to work on and basically that's what i would work on develop some more and then if i feel the need to photo bash again then i will go through the process of photo bashing again where i put in some photos um, do some lights, light tweaks and whatnot, then put them all back in one layer, blend them all back in, and then again, start, restart the painting process. So it's an on again, off again, kind of process, uh, rinse and repeat kind of process where I continuously just keep on doing it, layering and layering, um, photos and artwork in until I get to a good happy point with my piece, basically. And uh, right now I have an image of uh, Christoph Young's study of Rococo design, which uh, if you guys have been watching some of my videos in my channel, I guess you guys will realize that I am very, very heavily influenced by this art genre, this art period, the Baroque Rococo period. Um, I like the flourishes, I like the design. Um, I think that design is partially inspired by the Duke's Ex Machina series. Um, I think that was like one of my first exposure to the Rococo design in a sci-fi setting. Um, if you were to look at the very first, not the very first or second Juice, Juice X, because the first and second Juice X was real really like early 2000 or something. But the one that came around 2010, 2012, um, I forgot which one that was. Um, but I remember when I was playing that game and watching uh, some of the uh, some of the documentary on how they made that piece, they talk a lot about the Shakespearean era and and whatnot. And even though the Shakespearean era is not the same as the Baroque Rococo era, there, there's kind of overlaps in design, essentially. So yeah, in a way, that game kind of inspired me with the whole Baroque Rococo design in a sci-fi setting. But another game that kind of solidified it for me is the Final Fantasy 12 or 13. It could be 14, I'm not sure. But it's the Final Fantasy game. Um, I think, you know what? Let me look it up on Wikipedia just to confirm which Final Fantasy it was that has the Rococo Baroque design. It was Final Fantasy 13. Final Fantasy 13, the machines on that series 
is very phenomenal. Uh, I have to say they have Baroque, Rococo elements to it. Um, I really dug the design on that one. So that one was uh, very, it was a very good inspiration for me essentially. And so, yeah, a lot of my sci-fi designs have been influenced by it basically. And as for the Duke's Ex Machina, let me look that one up too, because now I'm curious as to which one it is. Uh, I know it wasn't Mankind Divided, because Mankind Divided was the last one that just came out. Deuce X Human Revolution was the game I was thinking of. So yeah. The Baroque Rococo design. <laughs> I really like it. In my sci-fi illustrations, I I've been using that motif quite a lot l lately. Uh, my solar punk my solar punk clock um, illustration that I did not too long ago uh, was influenced by that design motif too. As well as a few others, um, there's a few illustrations that I've done already that has uh, those design elements to it. Now I've mentioned Baroque Rococo before in my previous videos because obviously I'm very heavily influenced by it. Um, but I guess now would be a great time for us to take a look at it in Wikipedia and see what Wikipedia has to say about the movement. Um, so, um, according to Wikipedia, um, Rococo, less commonly known as Rococo or Late Baroque, is an exceptionally ornamental and theatrical style of architecture, art, and decoration which combines asymmetry, scrolling curves, gilding, white and pastel colors, sculpted molding, which is my favorite part I guess, um, and trompe-l'oeil frescoes to create surprise and illusion of motion and drama. Uh, it first appeared in France and Italy in the 1730s and spread to Central Europe in the 17th 1750s and 1760s. It is often described as a final expression of the Baroque movement, which, um, according to history, Baroque uh, pretty much followed the Renaissance area. So, um, when I mentioned earlier that Duke's ex human revolution, um, when they were talking about they were when they were making that video game, they were more influenced by Renaissance rather than Baroque. But that's the reason why I kind of equated the two together because there was some overlap in the genre. So late Renaissance was followed pretty much by the Baroque movement. And then the one that I love out of all the Baroque movement is Rococo, which is late Baroque. Um, and I hope I pronounced that right. But yeah, um, it's more of an architecture. Uh, a lot of floral flourishes, on which you could even see in in the girl's spacesuit right now. Um, in her helmet, um, in her helmet, you can see uh, the uh, flourishes, the molded, oh, not the molded, but the sculpted molding that I was talking about is very common in Rococo architecture. Um, you'll see a lot of these flourishes, this floral uh, curves and uh, flowers and leaves. It's it's just very sculptural, you know, for an architecture style. 
And to combine that with something mechanical like a spacesuit or uh, like a robot, for example, um, it's kind of a challenge, essentially. Like the challenge for me, especially in this particular illustration, is to how to pull off that design very well and make it look good, you know. Because, in all honesty, if you look at this illustration, you know, at the end of it, after I finished it, you know, you could pretty much just ask yourself whether or not the flourishes that I added on it look good on her. <laughs> and I could tell you that it's kind of a hit or miss almost, you know, it's kind of like a yay, sort of a yay, but can also be a nay in a way. Um, I've been mentioning this a few times in some of my other illustrations where I try to pursue this design. Um, I just haven't been very successful at it, essentially. Um, uh, I guess, um, yeah, I just haven't been very happy with some of the designs. I mean, I want to explore it and I want to keep going at it because, you know, it is something that I'm fascinated with. And when I see artists like Christoph Young or Olya Bothak or, um, or Pete or Paul Kotelevitz, uh, I think that's how you say his name. Um, when I look at their artwork and how they do their Baroque Rococo design, it's just it's just very phenomenal, you know. And I see it in other artists, and I'm like, wow, they pull it off so well. But then when I try to attempt to pull it on my own designs, it's just like, yeah, you know. I think some people might like it. I like it okay. So yeah. Um. But yeah, I'll, I'll just continue doing it and I'll continue exploring it, you know, uh, who knows, maybe one of these days, you know, a Baroque Rococo robot that I make, I'm finally like completely extremely happy with how I design it. And I would be like, yes, I can finally rest this <laughs> obsession with this design motif, you know, but for now, I, I'm not giving up my obsession with it because I haven't found success in it yet i guess you could say but yeah so this design i guess is my attempt i'm doing the whole baroque rococo design putting it part of uh the spacesuit which you know obviously kind of looks weird <laughs> i mean there's aside from the fancy look of it there's absolutely no need for the spacesuit to have all these flowers on it you know um it is completely a design motif no function to it whatsoever but it absolutely looks cool i would have to say so yeah um but yeah um uh, as as a critique of function versus form this is uh or function versus design uh this is definitely more design than than function there's <laughs> no need for the flourishes but yeah they are there because it just looks cool and oh yeah i, I since i mentioned the name christoph young alia balsak paul kotelovitz um I've mentioned Christoph Young before, and obviously we're looking at one of his studies. Um, that photo of the Baroque study that floats every now and then, that's his study. Thank you so much for letting me use it <laughs> to reference for my own designs. Um, Mr. Christoph Young, you're my hero. Um, but I also wanted to mention all you boss hack and Paul Kotelovitz. I've mentioned them before, but I could never figure out what their names were. Paul Katalevitz is 1D Inc. Um, he's the guy that I've been trying to figure out his name forever. And then I finally figured it out. It's Paul. He is an amazing blender sculptor. Uh, does a lot of the Baroque Rococo design. And Miss Ray Cat Oya Bostak. Um, she has some awesome designs as well. So do check them out. So yeah.
So a few sketchzone.net um, members and artists, as well as uh, a few conceptart.org artists, have mentioned to me before that um, I have a huge tendency to lean towards pink and green. Um, those two color schemes, those two colors are very predominantly, very predominant colors in my portfolio. And I didn't even recognize that until somebody mentioned it. Um, do you believe it was Agems from conceptart.org slash uh, sketchzone.net? He mentioned it and, you know, a few people has been encouraging me to, you know, stay away from those two colors. Um, so in this particular illustration, um, somehow I found myself leaning towards pink again, which is really strange because when I first started out, I was really leaning towards more red um, more than anything else. And so I started to lean towards pink and so I did a few color uh, adjustments to get me back to red slash orange, which is where I am right now. Um, so after receiving those few comments, I figured, okay, well, let me do some changes in the color and I ended up liking this red, you know, and I honestly thought that it was fine. It was okay. Um, because it's not as pink as some of my other pieces are. It's more red slash orange, but in the end I decided against this, um, Again, because I was still receiving the comments of the too pink, too warm, essentially. And so, you know, you could see like towards later on in the illustration process, I will eventually end up switching this back to blue, which I actually doing right now. It's funny how I start mentioning that and it happens. So here I am messing around with some more with the color adjustments. And then finally, I ended up with this blue one with the pink highlights and I really dig this one well when I finally saw this I was like all right this is it we're gonna settle for this color so this became the illustration so yeah what ended up or what was a red spacesuit has now become a blue spacesuit And I really had trouble with the design of the helmet. I mean, out of all the flourishes and out of all the details that I added onto this spacesuit, um, the helmet just gave me so much trouble. This area right here that I'm working on, I just I did not know what to put on there. You know, I wasn't sure at all as to how to approach this whole thing. Um, I wanted some of the flourishes in there, but it felt like it was too heavy with it. So I took some out, you know, and then brought them, brought some of the flourishes back in because I was like, yeah, maybe that's looking too bare, but then ended up taking them all out again. It was like a back and forth process. But I think this is pretty much close to the final, if not the final. Actually, no, I don't think this is a final. I think I went and changed the helmet some more eventually later on. Um, but the top part of the helmet, I'm pretty sure that that's pretty much stayed the way it is. So yeah, at this point in time, when I took that... Uh, illustration that I did the one that I turned in for the chow piece or for the chow competition um basically I, when I took that you know even though that was already detailed enough and could stand alone as a good enough illustration um I know that I could layer in some more details um which is what this whole thing is uh really it's just me just really pushing the details and adding it some more, adding some more uh, flourishes and whatnot. So yeah, for the next hour or so, it's just me pretty much just expounding on the design that has already transpired in the first half of it. 
in the first half of this video. And I'm really glad that um, that this is one of my illustrations where I did not use the manual best the Yoni Lab character creator at all. Uh, I know I've mentioned MB Lab to you guys before. Um, it's a plugin for Blender that creates characters, and I use it a lot to use as uh, my human references, you know, so I don't have to look for photos to look at or, uh, or you know, it's a quick um, way for me to create humans, essentially, basically. Um, but yeah, for some odd reason, instead of uh, rendering a face in MB Lab to use as a reference for this character, I pretty much just decided to just, you know, I'm just gonna paint it from memory and so yeah I'm kind of glad that I did that because you know I don't do that often enough I don't paint faces from memory often enough um, I predominantly use MB lab or some photos to use as a reference but for this particular one I just painted it straight from memory um, now whether it's successful or not it's up to you guys to decide um, I think it's okay um, the thing that I don't like about it is the nose. I was I never quite figured out what was wrong with the nose. Um, there's just something off to me. There's something off about the nose uh, for me, uh, and I never quite figured it out. But since no one of my artist friends ever mentioned it or have ever noticed it, um, when I asked for a critique, I figured it's not a big enough deal for me to worry about it. So I just decided to just let it go. But yeah, um, I really dig that face. Except for the nose, I really dig that face. You know, for a face that I drew from memory. So yeah, thank you sketchstone.net members and concept.org members for helping me out with this illustration. You guys are always a great resource. <laughs> so yeah, do appreciate, appreciate, appreciate you guys for your comments. There goes Christoph Young's photo again. Man, look at those that design. Um, the drawing that Christoph Young did. It's so gorgeous how he did that. And this is what I mean about looking at other people's um work on baroque and rococo when when i see how they draw baroque and rococo i'm like i'm like wow that's impressive but when i try to pull it off i'm on my work i'm like eh. so yeah but now that i got to look at christoph young's work again i'm like wow he did really good that's that's some really good flourishes right there very gorgeous
I really like how I detailed these strips, I guess, these clothing strips that wraps around her arms uh, and wraps all around her body, that green area. Um, I was really debating on how best to approach the look and texture of it and I was glad that I found a texture in Krita's brush list that I could use uh, well I found a texture that I could use on my brush to simulate the look of uh, the strips and I don't know what you call it um, you typically see it in backpacks and whatnot. Um, those little strips that you pull to tighten or to loosen up the backpack. Um, they kind of have this texture to it. Um, and that's kind of like what I was trying to emulate with this crater brush. Um, I It's basically just like a rake brush of some sort that I modify slightly. Uh, so that when I make my strokes, it would look like those clothing strips that I, I was talking about. But yeah, I experimented an arm and then when I figured out the look that I wanted, then I pretty much employed it in all the green green strips on the girl's uh, spacesuit. And right now I'm making adjustments on the arm. Um, I really had issues with the whole proportion issue. Uh, I didn't know how long her arm should be or uh, how bent it is. Um, I know that if her arm is bent, it can't be that long. Um, if it's straight, it needs to be long. Um, basically, the tip of the fingers needs to reach... To reach um, it reaches about mid thigh in a person that's standing and what I was having issues with was the fact that she's kind of leaning back which would put uh, her fingers lower on her leg by comparison but her arms were also bent so you know I kind of had issues on how to do the arm placement and whether it was too long or not too long so yeah and I messed around with it some more I think throughout the illustration but yeah I had proportion issues um, the whole time with this piece uh, I remember messing around with the head also because some people have commented that it's too small while I think that it's you know a good size uh, I think someone might have mentioned that it's too big so yeah it wasn't very clear what the size of the head was but I remember just messing around with it and I remember like looking it up online um, to see like what the exact measurements are because from what I remember I've always remembered a person to be seven heads tall but apparently according to some anatomy uh, books it's actually eight heads long and so uh, yeah there was this debate about whether that head is too small or too big because some people were thinking that it should be eight heads long while I was thinking that it should only be seven heads long so yeah in the end I kind of just hovered around my original estimation which is was which is about seven heads long so yeah but for anyone curious as to how many heads there are or how many heads there are in the typical person's height um, if you're a child slash teenager slash woman it's typically around seven heads long if you're a tall adult male it's about eight heads long so yeah there are about eight heads um, if you stack up eight heads all on top of each other that would be your average tall uh, adult man so yeah but that's the reason why there's this discrepancy between seven or eight and it really just depends on the gender and the age of the person younger ones and kids obviously has like seven uh, really young kids like uh, toddlers and whatnot I think are like five heads tall or something um, and then when you get to childhood, it becomes like five, seven, or se six, seven heads, something like that.
so yeah little proportion tips for you guys <laughs> I remember being really, really afraid of detailing her torso. Um, I, I just remembered like hesitating on it a lot and detailing or delaying the detailing of the torso for some reason. Um, but eventually I got over that fear and just went for it. Um, you can see that I changed it a lot. Um, I guess there was, uh, I guess part of my hesitation on working on it is the actual design. Um, I wasn't too happy with it. So you'll see in a few minutes how eventually when I just went ahead and just went for it, I 
and when I got brave to finally work on the torso, I I changed a lot of the details of the the green part, anyways. Uh, the green green strips. So yeah. And so here I am changing a lot of the details because I wasn't too happy with it. So I took some parts out. And I just I just did a lot of heavy edits on this torso. Took those out and drew some details in. And then I changed some of these details that I drew in. So yeah, back and forth, back and forth, just working on it. And I think part of my problem too was the fact that the girl is leaning back so it's kind of hard for me to figure out um, anatomy wise how everything was going to get laid out so yeah And here I am working some more on the face. Um, yeah, I added some more details. I figured um, I took the approach that I did earlier um, when the illustration was in low resolution. What I did was uh, I enlarged the face, drew the details in, and then shrunk it back down. Um, I decided that I was pretty much going to do the same thing too in this big resolution um, format. So yeah, um, I did most of my detailing huge and then shrunk it in. And again, like I said, I just I don't know what it is with the nose that I did wrong, but I just I don't like how it looks. I mean, I like the top part, but the bottom part, uh, yeah, not so much. So yeah, 
but here I am kind of just straightening things out doing some color corrections and I also detailed her teeth out and for some odd reason I decided to give her fangs <laughs> I don't know why I wanted to give her fangs but I did um, although on my defense realistically people do have fangs um, under teeth but it's not as pronounced as what I did in this particular painting so this video will show you in a few minutes what I'm talking about but yeah I really like this face for drawing it without reference I, I thought I did good again aside from the nose there's something off with the nose that I don't like I don't know what it is with the nose but I just don't like it <laughs> But other than that little problem that I have, I, I thought this was a decent looking face for not looking at reference. I totally forgot that I gave her green eyes. <laughs> I just now noticed that she actually has green eyes. How cool. I might have done some tweaks to it though towards the end to where it's not green anymore. But yeah, I did, now that I'm watching this video again, I'm like, oh yeah, green eyes. That's what I gave her. Totally cool. So here I am working the teeth and I made a mistake. I think I gave the fangs on the second teeth from the center when really it should be the third teeth from the center. And if you were if anyone is to look at their own teeth, you act, you know, most everyone has that fangs, but it's not as pronounced as what I made it on her face. Like it shouldn't be that sharp. But yeah, it ended up being sharp on my drawing so yeah and again like I said it shouldn't be the second one from the center it should be like the third one from the center but yeah here I am uh, comparing the old one to the new face and obviously I ended up like obviously I like the new face better so I kept it but I'm like doing tweaks to kind of combine them both. So yeah. And Ramin, Ramin Afshari from uh, Sketchdown.net made a comment about how the helmet should have some form of reflections on it. Or not the helmet, but the bubble glass on the helmet should have some form of reflections on it so i absolutely love that piece of advice because when he gave me that piece of advice um everything started looking really really good he also mentioned something about uh the metallic sheen uh the plastic metallic sheen of most uh metals that uh he mentioned that I needed to work on it and so I added this color dodge layer uh, basically to add highlights on the metal and when I did it everything started looking even better I was like wow okay yeah this is cool except the one thing that I did differently though was that I decided that um, the advice that he gave about the metallic look you know adding that gloss to it um, I decided that I was gonna put it in a separate layer but instead of putting it now 
I was going to do it later after most of my detailing is done. So um, not too long ago, you saw me experiment with the gloss of the metal and then it's gone again. And it's because I decided that I was going to put it as last so I don't have to keep painting over it um, and whatnot. So yeah, I decided I was going to put it last. So eventually that gloss, that metal gloss will come back. Um, but yeah, those two advices, the metal gloss and the reflections in the helmet, I really love those suggestions. It really pushed the realism of my illustration. So yeah. Here's the reflected gloss in the helmet that I worked on. So cool when I added it. So yeah, there's my proportion guide <laughs> that I took a look at to remind me how tall, how many heads a person's height should be. And here I am adding some gloss in and a separate layer and a separate color dodge layer. So I take it back. I thought I added the color dodge layer last, but it looks like that I'm doing the gloss halfway through the illustration. And I guess I just kept adding to it uh, the more I go along with my illustration or the further I go with my illustration. And it looks to me like I might have hit exhaustion point at that part right there. Um, I mentioned this in one of my videos uh, before. When I stare at a piece for too long and nothing's going on um, in the video, that means I'm exhausted. Um, I'm exhausted just painting. So at that point in time, I... I would have either switched a different painting or stopped painting altogether just to give my brain a break but yeah in this case I think uh, I might have stopped and so all of this is uh, an totally different day now
Okay, so yeah, I am adding to the gloss layer um, as I go along with the illustration. And here I am changing my changing the strips again in the torso area. Man, I had such a hard time with this area.
And so now the torso area is pretty much almost done. It finally just came together. Um, I finally got over the fear of not working or of the fear of working on it. Because like I mentioned earlier, I was I was afraid to touch it for some odd reason. I just wasn't confident about what I was doing. Then I finally got over it and I was like, okay, I dig this. I like this. Let's move on. But yeah, the first, the top half of her uh, body was, just took forever. I just remember that. Um, I remember that by the time I got to detailing the legs, uh, things were going a lot more smoother. Um, and it went by a lot faster. Um, and probably because of the fact that, you know... By the time I reached her legs, I kind of had the uh, techniques down, you know. Like, I already know what brush to use for the green strips. Uh, I know how to handle the Rococo design at this point, you know. So, yeah, by the time I reached her legs, um, it went by way quicker than it did with the other, with the top half of her body. Here I am adding some more to the gloss layer, make it look more metallic.
So this illustration is pretty much close to being finished. Um, as you can see, I'm, I'm working on the legs right now, and uh, it's almost close to being finished uh, detail-wise. Um, and so far, I've, I've been really happy with the illustration and how it um, ended up looking. Well, the design of the character anyways. Except for the Baroque Rococo part that I'm kind of still, yeah. But overall, you know, I'm happy with the design. Um, it was the illustration altogether, like the whole complete thing, the whole complete package. I was still kind of, eh, at this point too. It wasn't until I started getting comments from the Krita group. Um, I'm part of a, of a group in Facebook. Uh, a bunch of Krita users um, have a Krita group in it. <laughs> and I posted this asking for comments and critiques. And one of the critiques I got was to change the background. And I honestly think I also got the comment critique at sketchzone.net too. But it didn't really occur in my head that, um, or it didn't, I didn't get reminded of that problem up until someone in the Krita group mentioned it. And so when I switched out the background, um, the lame yellowish blackish background that I have, once I switched that out with this photo that I found from the NASA website, um, I forgot which nebula it is. It's a photo of a nebula. Once I replaced it with that one, everything just kind of came together. Um, the photo wasn't as dark looking. Um, it was brighter. Um, and at that point, I realized, you know, I could add some more stuff to this illustration that would really make it pop. Um, I think it was right around this time when I saw a photo uh, of Jennifer Whistling. I think that's how you pronounce her name. She's an artist for Riot. If I'm not wrong, I think that's where she works. And she posted one of her illustrations that she just recently finished had a lot of... Um... um has a lot of flares has a lot of uh lens flares to it uh, she added the lens flare effect uh in one of her illustrations and i realized that i could employ the same thing after seeing that illustration of jennifer whistling uh, with the lens flare i was like you know what i could do the same exact thing for my illustration so towards the end of this illustration i decided to change the background and add some lighting effects um, and when I did that, everything was just like, Whoa, like it literally like changed the photo from like this all right illustration to this illustration that I really dig, you know, it was, it became really beautiful essentially. Um, I ended up working a little bit on GIMP on this particular, um, video. You'll see it in a few seconds. Mainly because Krita's filters doesn't have the lens flare effect um, as part of it. Um, so I jumped on GIMP uh, to get this lens flare effect. And for the ones who are curious, all, all you really needed to do is to generate the lens flare effect on the black layer. An all black layer. And then you basically take that black layer and change the um blending mode to screen when you do that it knocks out all the black and all that is left is the lens flares so what i did was i went to gimp generated all those layers exported it out as tiff files i, I think i exported it as tiff files imported it into krita as layers and again like i said you know all you do is you change the blending mode of that layer to screen and it would take out all the black um, so yeah, all you're left is the lens flare and basically I moved the lens flare around to where I would want to position it in the illustration. And then after adding the lens flare, I added more stuff to it where, um, I added a bunch of, uh, blurred, blurred colors on the color dodge layer. Uh, I basically have like a strip of blue light, I think, or a strip of blue color that I blurred out. So it has, um, 
it doesn't have sharp edges and then i put that as color dodge uh on top of some of the lens flares to uh, some I, I did that on top of some of the lens flares and what it does is that it really brings out more of uh the brightness um so yeah those are some of the steps that i undertook towards the end of this illustration which goes by real quick i mean because we're almost towards the end of the video right now and right now all you're seeing is still me just detailing you know right now i'm detailing the shoes but right after this part right as soon as i'm like done with detailing the rest of the steps are just pretty much just the lighting effects that i did so yeah and the lighting effects that I did are all on separate layers because typically I do everything in one layer. I paint everything in one layer. It's in the case of this particular illustration, all the girl is in one layer and then the background is in another layer. And then when I decided that I was going to do the lighting effects, all those lighting effects went on their own separate layers. Um, so yeah, you can see the layer manager right now towards the lower right. Uh, there's only a few layers right now, but in the next few minutes those layers are going to explode there's going to be like a bunch of layers that i'm going to put on top of this girl just to put everything together so yeah So right now I'm inspecting the look. Yeah, see, okay, yeah, I'm digging the look. I like the look of the girl the background. Yeah, not so much. The Rococo design, yeah, you know, it's okay. I mean, some parts are great, some parts are eh, you know, but it's working, I guess you could say. So yeah, but I'm adding some final touches and then I'm going to jump to Gimp. Here I am at GIMP, and uh, here's my first try at that new background layer. Here's me generating all the lens flare effects. Uh, I, I did a bunch because there's like different options, so I just did a bunch in different layers and I saved them all out as separate layers. And I didn't use all of them, I only used like a few of them. You see me expo export them out. Yeah, slowly but surely I'm exporting them out and I'm gonna bring them back into Krita. And then I switch out the background after finding that in NASA. So there's the photo. It's all different now and it looks so much better. Now it's so much brighter. Instead of the piece being so dark, it's so much brighter. And then I added a lens flare in that that light area on her helmet and then the one in the arm. I'm setting all of those layers into screen mode. And I think I was running into some problems too with uh with the layering of it. So I think I had to go back to GIMP and put some of the layers together or something. I, I don't remember exactly what problem what problem I ran into, but I knew I was running into some form of problem that I had to re-render everything. And so here I am tweaking that lens flare that I got from GIMP again. And at some point I'm going to add that strip. There's the blue strip. I blurred it out so it's softer. And then I'm going to put it in color dodge. Um, or I'm going to change that layer into color dodge. Which I think I just did just now. So yeah, now it looks brighter. It's so subtle too, like you could barely see it from this far. But it adds such a huge different dimension to the painting. So yeah, I, these were my last steps into this illustration. All this lighting effects that really made this piece so much better. But yeah. Finishing touches, almost done. And there's some more of the lens flares. Adding them all black in. Some more color dodge blurs and there it is.
painting is done thank you so much for watching guys thank you for going through it with me i hope you have a great night good night